Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show... Gyro released the new Manifest helmet with the spherical technology. Getting Ziggy with Forbidden Bikes. Also, new protection from Dionese. And Camelback have got some great new Camelbacks. Okay, and straight into news, we've got a lot of products to get through today. Um, we actually had a lot of stuff turn up, which is quite cool, including this brand new helmet from Giro. This is the Manifest Spherical. Now it's got loads of features, so I'm gonna buzz through these because otherwise we'll never get going. So it's got a spherical MIPS system. It's essentially two helmets. Um, well, look for yourself. You can see what it does. The inner helmet moves around an outer helmet rather than your head moving around on the inside of the helmet as you would see on other MIPS style systems and other helmets that have sort of rotational injury prevention. Now, rotational injuries are a nasty thing and arguably this is probably the best way to deal with this. It completely isolates your head from that kind of injury. Impressive stuff. Now it's got a huge amount of vents on it, I think it's 19 vents, huge channels just to pull the air into the helmet and release them out the top and out the back for those exhaust ports. It has the Aura system here, which is an Aramid bridge. So this is unbreakable. And they used this so they could incorporate these massive vents because really riding a big full suspension bikes around is hot work. And you wanna be able to get rid of all of that heat as much as possible. So that is one of the key features on this helmet. And of course, that bridge really does keep the helmet in one piece and it forms a structural part of the helmet there. Uh, the Peak doesn't have indexing anymore, um, or I say anymore, the Switchblade, the bigger brother style helmet to this with the clip-on full face section. It has a slight indexing to it, which means sometimes you could flip the Peak up if you're um, riding through the woods and only one side would go up. And of course your mates are gonna tell you how, how bad that looks, are they? They're just gonna let you ride with it. So you're not gonna get that anymore. Of course it accommodates a goggle under there. You've got the rubber ridging on the back here which means the goggle strap is going to sit in place really well. Now, let's look at the inside. So you've got the Fidlock system on here. Now, until you've used Fidlock, you don't realise how cool this is and how old the buckle is. I mean, buckles work. You see them on everything. You see them on rucksacks, you see them on life jackets. For good reason, they work and everyone knows how to use them, including emergency services. But arguably, the system from Fidlock is even better. Super, super simple, really neat, really nice to use. Definitely a bit more of a premium feature, that. Now it's got um, antibacterial lining on it. It's from Xstatic, it's the XT2 system. I believe it's got like an aluminium weave in it or something bizarre, but uh, the whole point is it's not gonna get funky after you've been sweating your ass off for a few rides in there. And interestingly, with the Rocklock Trail Air System, so that is their retention system on the inside, well, firstly, it's got rubber padding on it, so it's really comfortable on the back of your head where it cradles your head. And that's really important, because that's key in how, how a helmet like this works. But when you adjust it, you actually got a three mil gap. There's daylight between the rock lock system and your head, which means air can literally channel over the front of your head. Now I've never seen something like that on a mountain bike helmet before. Can you imagine all of that air intake and air being able to flow over the front of your head as well? That is gonna be phenomenal. There's also uh, eyewear sort of rubber grippers here. So if you're gonna wear your eyewear in the top of the helmet here, just for the climb, they're gonna basically stay in place nicely there. Um, a super featured helmet, like I can't emphasize enough how quality this looks in the flesh. It doesn't even have like uh, decals on it. Even this is like, um, you've got like laser cutouts in the shell and you've got thermoplastic rubber basically pushed through from the inside. It's detailing like that, that really sets it apart. Really nice little bolts on here. Like literally everything about it looks fantastic. Three position adjustable rock lock on the inside there. Now, a size medium, I think I'm right saying, yeah, it retails, sorry, size medium retails, it, it weighs 346 grams, so it's not a lot of weight for a very protective helmet. The price though, 260 US dollars, that's about 270 in euros and about 250 in UK pounds sterling. Um, it's definitely a top of the line helmet, but it does have every single feature you could possibly want from a helmet. Comes in loads of colors, although in my eyes, um, there's only one color, and this is it, it looks amazing. And I think Chris Ackley is using this color as well, so it's gotta be cool, eh? Also in the news this week, we're seeing a new take on what is already a very popular and very sought after bike, the Forbidden Druid. So for those of you that don't know, the Druid kind of hits a couple of magic points at the moment in terms of on-trend mountain bikes. It's 29 trail bike with aggressive numbers, and also, it's got that high pivot. Now, the reason bikes with high pivots are kind of on everyone's lips at the moment is not just because of the large amount of success they've enjoyed over the last couple of years on the World Cup circuit, but it basically means you can negate some of the problems you might get with 
certain suspension designs, like you know, lots of pedal feedback. What you do is you basically run the chain using an idler over that pivot and it kind of really changes up how the suspension feels and it gives you a lot more freedom, especially in regards to a bike that's got to go up and down. So what is this new take? Well, it is the new Ziggy linkage. So Forbidden, like lots of companies, had their interest piqued by these new mullet bikes, these mixed wheel setups, and they kind of wanted to explore it. So they did the obvious thing and put a 27.5 wheel in the back of a 29er and they thought, hmm, maybe there's something in this. So they carried on exploring until they bought out this new linkage. So the Ziggy linkage is there to offset some of the differences because if you put a 27 wheel in the back of a bike that is designed for 29, you might suddenly find things like bottom bracket, etc., aren't quite where you'd want them. So what this does is it takes the, um, the geometry changes from putting a 27 wheel in the back because don't forget that's going to affect everything from seat to bottom bracket height and by making some small changes, they're just kind of making the bike sit up more to offset, offset the difference really. And you can see from these pictures, you've got the production 29, the prototype, and now the production um, mixed wheel linkage. You can see how small those differences are, but how important that ends up being. You know, you often see bikes with flip chips and people say, how much difference is it really? Well, it can be quite a lot, especially in the feel of our suspension. So I think this is really cool. They also released this absolutely bite the back of your hand, beautiful, deep purple colorway that just, I think it looks truly beautiful, a really classy looking bike. The bike before already had people salivating. So now in this color, boy, oh boy, it's gonna have, well, it's gonna turn some heads at the trails, that's for sure. So what do you guys think? Now, how, who here? has experimented with these mixed wheel setups. And did you feel there was anything wrong with it? Did you feel, hmm, actually, maybe I need to do some tinkering? Like we've talked about this so much before and we actually have featured pro bikes that have gone to extreme lengths to keep those geometry dimensions where they want them. But I think it's really good to see a company like Forbidden, who's already known for being quite progressive, just go straight to the source and be like, listen, people are gonna do this. So let's make it easier. Good on them, I reckon. Okay, next up in news are a few uh, protective items actually. So we've got some knee pads here called the Trail Skins Pro from Dennis. Now Dennis, of course, you might know them from the MotoGP world, very famous for their back protectors, uh, giving a humpback sort of um, profile, I guess you could call it. In fact, I think they were the first company to produce a back protector. I think it was in conjunction with Barry Sheen way back in the 70s, I guess, um, for MotoGP. And of course, they are experts in producing protection wear that suits two-wheeled activities. Now the mountain bike pads have always been excellent and these new ones are no different. They've got nice mesh fabric on them, uh, they've got silicon rubber around the insides, the top and bottom there, nice wide um, elastic straps with hook and loop fastenings on them so you can really crank them up tight and they're not restrictive and not uncomfortable. Great for pedaling all day, they've got a nice open back of knee design there, they've got side protection here as well for those little knocks you can get on like your stem and just other things that can be so painful so they've really got that down and of course the main pad itself is extremely flexible this is one of the the biggest things with a pad like this so of course you can get other pads that might arguably have like more protection ultimately with a, a hard cap design but the problem is you've got to pedal those things. So if you're going to be pedaling all day, if you're a trail rider or even an enduro racer, something like this is going to be really beneficial for you. A uh, really, really cool piece of kit. And of course, something I really especially like about these, I like the minimal side of protection, but this would definitely inspire me to wear something like this a little bit, a little bit more in terms of protection from what I normally wear because they're heavily ventilated. I can't stand getting hot. The air can pass like, all the way through this. What a cool design, and you can see how that would work really well in the form of an impact. Although, it would fill up with mud, gotta say. But they retail for about 80 quid here in the UK. Uh, they look very good to me. And they've also got a really good new jacket. So let's just drag the jacket in. And it's also got, as you can probably see here, it's got hydration bladder built in. So their early jackets were adapted for motorcycle jackets, but this is dedicated for mountain biking use. As you can see, it's got the same style protection as knee pads on the shoulders here. It's actually removable as well, so you can tune the way you want to wear this. It's got rib cage padding on here. It's all got nice sort of lining, so it's not going to get too funky. But the really cool thing is the back protector. So the back protector, as you can tell, 
also has a hydration bladder in it. And again, it's a modular design. So you can take the hydration bladder out, you can take the back protector out. So for example, if you are uh, maybe doing a race where you wanted to wear a backpack, but you still wanted the shoulder and chest protection. So that whole thing comes out. And of course, you can actually take this off as well. So it's a very cool system. It passes level one protection. So you get two levels of protection for back protectors. Um, level two is slightly more severe. Um, level one is more than adequate for any mountain biking use, but ultimately it's gonna offer you really good protection because it's part of you. It's always gonna be on your back. A uh, really cool bit of kit from Danny there. Uh, and they retail for, I think they're 200, yeah, 200 quid here in the UK. If you're getting back into racing and you wanna try some bigger stuff, Something like this really is a great idea. Back protection, shoulder protection, and something that's very minimal, and of course, very modular. Great bit of kit, that. Okay, next up is the Camelback Chase 8. So this is a three liter hydration pack, a little bit different to most mountain bike hydration packs, in that it looks a little bit more, and I don't think Camelback will mind me saying this, like a, uh, a trail running pack. The way it fits across the front, it's like a vest, so it's gonna sit slightly higher on your body, and they're incredibly secure. It's a very different concept to those that sit lower down and have a big waist buckle system on them. So again, it's a three liter bladder on the inside. You've got tool storage in here. You've got big stretch compartments on the sides here. And on the chest, you've got phone pockets. You've got stuff you could put bananas in and other energy gels and storage stuff. But it's all about the fit. I mean, again, it's a three liter bladder and it's got plenty of storage on this, but the fact is it's much higher this thing is like an anchor when it's on you. I've tried this on already. The fit is fantastic. You can put an LED light on the rear there. If you're caught short, for example, plenty of room in there to store it. Great piece of kit. A little bit different for mountain bikers to have a pack like this. I, th I think we've seen those with the USWE packs that Steve, Pete and Co wear. But um, first time I've seen it from Camelback on a dedicated mountain bike pack. And there's also another orientation of it. So slightly smaller. Um, in design. This one has a two litre bladder in it, but it has a back protector. So you could choose for, from having more protection, sorry, from more hydration and less protection and vice versa. So this one has a level two back protector in it. Now this thing is offers maximum in back protection. Now I was always a little bit skeptical of these in hydration packs before, but because of the way this fits like a vest, I can see this has been a really, really good idea for mountain bikers. Two litre bladder in there, all of the features you expect to see on any decent hydration pack. Again, it's got the vest system. On the front here, you've got twin sternum straps, you've got an emergency whistle. Literally all the features you can imagine from Camelback. A very cool, full featured pack. Uh, the Chase 8 retails for 125 US dollars and the Chase Protector Vest for 200 US dollars. Again, the emphasis is protection with this one. If you're looking at doing some racing this year or you wanna go uh, into the Alps or some other adventurous riding, having some sort of good protection like this, or like we suggested earlier on, the Danisi uh, Rival Vest is a great idea. Well, there we go, some great new gear there from Camelback. Okay, now it's quiz time. So I'm gonna ask you three questions and later on in the show, Henry is gonna give you those answers. Now I want you to delve into your little tech minds there and see if you can come up with these answers. So coming up on the screen is gonna be question number one. Why doesn't Hope, that is Hope Technology, the UK company make look really cool anodized brakes. Why don't they sell their team green gear? Number two, Cane Creek was in its original guise, named as what? And number three, the Maxxis Asagai is a very good aggressive tire, but which downhill racer helped develop it? I'll give you an extra half point as well if you give us a clue as to what the name Asagai means. So now it is time for Top Mod. So this is the part of the show where we get to show off your hard work. So it's certainly a good deal for us. Now in this part of the show, we've had you know things like transmission changes. We've had people taking a rattle can to their bikes with mixed success. We've had people welding their bikes like last week. And every now and then we get somebody who works in the industry sending something in. And this is one of those weeks. But if you do have your own submission and you think it could be good on the show, get it in using the uploader below and hopefully we can feature it. But on to this week's submission. So it is from Flow Rider Racing, not to be confused with the American rapper. And they are basically a Swiss distribution company for Revel, Rev Grips, 
Onyx and EXT. And basically they thought they'd make this, I mean, this crazy bike for Sea Otter just to showcase and take it over and, you know, be a good discussion point. So they made up this, well, you're going to see the bike in a moment, this crazy bike. And sadly, Sea Otter, like pretty much everything this year has been postponed or other events being cancelled. But they thought, well, we've still got this bike. What, what, <laughs> what can we do with this, this wild bike? So take a look at it. It's on your screen now. I mean, holy smokes. So let's just go through a couple of the components. So first up, it's got Intend suspension. So Intend is this kind of just wild company. They're just so cool. It's made by a chap called Cornelius who lives in Freiburg, who actually coincidentally went on a ride with my kind of chance as much as anything a couple of years ago. And his enthusiasm was infectious. He's so passionate and it was just really nice guy. Great to meet him, have a quick chat. And so they've got the Hover Shock, which is, I mean, just look it up. It's a crazy piece of kit and the Edge Fork. So both are very distinctive just by their silhouette. And some of the technology is equally individual. Not only that, they've got C-Tech componentry. Now we've featured them before because they make those crazy carbon axles. Loads of just, you know, remarkable, like some of it's really weight weeny, some of it's like kind of burlier, but loads of remarkable kit all across the board. And I think um, they're a fascinating company. So it's got loads of C-Tech. It's got some braking brakes. So they're basically an Italian company who nearly want to think it's like 120 world champs in motocross. And they're kind of starting to do more mountain biking. So this is a prototype of their new brake, which is basically a lot lighter, a bit more refined than their previous itineration. And it looks pretty cool. Not too dissimilar from kind of Hope. It's kind of got that sort of um, real metalwork sort of feel where you can tell they've, you know, really put some uh, thought into the architecture and it looks kind of quite industrial but in a really cool way. And it's got the Ingrid 12 speed drivetrain. So Ingrid is another Italian company that um, basically has kind of been prototyping things for a while now. You've been hearing things about them. This is a 12 speed rear mech. Apparently there should be a shifter on the way at some point. And it's got the Klein colorway. So the bike looks absolutely bonkers, like in the best possible way. I've got to admit, I think, you know, the um, the tires might be a bit rich for me, but that's okay. I think if, if there's one part of this bike that isn't a bit rich for you in some way, then, you know, you probably, you probably got a pretty crazy bike like this yourself. But I mean, just look at it. It is so cool. You know, everything, the detail it's gone to, I think, um, I just think it's absolutely brilliant. And I love the fact that, you know, all these companies kind of very European. And I really like that. You know, you've got some exceptions, you know, the rev grips and stuff, you know, but that's going to happen. But it's a bit like, um, coming back to Hope, it's like when people have a, like an orange with Hope parts and rental bars. I like that. I like when it's all kind of, you know, all from the same location. I just think it's cool. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is a very Eurocentric build. And isn't it remarkable? It's also got the uh, the saddle from SeaTech, where you know it's kind of a vegetarian saddle, so to speak. They didn't have to peel any cows, <laughs> which I suppose you know could could be good news. Depends which way you're standing, and um, but certainly a unique selling point. But um, yeah, I think it looks great. Now, guys, I've got a feeling that now when there's so much of this bike, that is something of you know it's all going on. But white tires. Do you agree with me? Come on. Like, they're white. Uh, I'm sorry, Onza. I'm sorry. I'm sure they're just a joy to ride, but it, it's just, like I said, hmm. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm a bit of a traditionalist in that way. But what do you think of the bike overall? Get in the comments below. And if you have something even half as extraordinary as this, get it into the uploader and hopefully we can feature it on the show. Okay, now it's time for Rewind, which is the retro section of the weekly show. All that cool tech you're riding today had to come from somewhere. So if you want to know about where anything in particular came from or what the first versions were, let us know. Ask away in the comments underneath. Use that hashtag Rewind. Alternatively, if you've got something old, you've seen something old, or you've got a friend or a dad or a relative that's got something old, take some photos and send them in. The link is right there at the bottom of the screen. Now, first up on your screen is this crazy neon pink, yellow, silver and black 
bike. So this is an MS Racing CR1 from 1989. I'm sure I've seen some of these around um, when I was younger, but I never knew what they were. It says dirt bike on it. That sounds cool, and it? it makes it sound quite moto. Uh, it's from Chris. Uh, it hasn't given any other details other than this is the bike. So it's got Panerasa smoke and dark tires, Celitalia turbo saddle on there. Uh, Shimano Dior DX transmission, so of course Dior we've just seen the other day is now up to 12 speed, so DX was one of the first mountain bike transmissions. XT was first, Dior DX took it down a level but actually I think it looked nicer. Uh, toe clips and straps, man I remember the pain of using those things. And look at that stem length on there, oh man that's a wicked old school bike. Note how the top tube slopes the complete opposite way to what modern bikes do. The frame actually looks Far more like a road bike frame than an, an off-road frame. It doesn't look too dissimilar to many of those gravel bikes you've seen people put flat bars on now. Um, kind of cool to see. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, next up is from Gary. He's in New Zealand. He's got a 1996 Santa Cruz Heckler and he's got loads of cool parts. So he's shown us a few. So I can see this with a box shot. It's a set of Magura HS33 race lines. And there we go, there's one of them right there. The original hydraulic rim brakes. Uh, Martin Ashton always used to use these back in the day as well. Incredible power up from them. So powerful, in fact, you had to have a brake booster for them because they put so much power onto the rims that they'd bend most frames out. So to clamp those brake bosses back together again. And they also had a very unique set of mounts. So you used to have an adapter system to use them on mountain bikes. Um, unless you had like a trials bike or an early Cannondale, something like that that had specific mounts for them on. Very cool though, and still actually they'd hold their own today because they were so powerful. Um, of course, most rims these days on higher end bikes are designed in mind for disc brake use rather than rims. But very cool, and there's a, there's a Gorilla brake arm right there, the sort of thing you would use in addition to a set of Maguras just to keep them in check. Look at that Shimano XTR there as well. That's rad. I think that was one of my favorites. The earliest one you could say is probably the purest. It looks slightly blue in color, but this charcoal gray option must have been 95, maybe 96. Can't kind of forget on timing, but it looks amazing. Really cool to see. Okay, some Shimano Dio DX. Uh, no, not Dio DX, just Shimano DX, because they actually came from the BMX world originally, the DX series. They had red V brakes you could get and they were the same as the uh, Dior LX series you could get on mountain bikes. Identical in fact, and the same with the levers, except they're red and black and they were aimed at the BMX or the 20 inch race world. And of course they're the pedals that go with it that all the downhill racers used to use in those days as well. Super tough, I bet you could give those a service and they'd still keep on going, no problems. Okay, over to Sabine now in Montpellier in France with a Sun Total 998 from 1998. Um, Rad old bike, this one. So this is a soft tail. So look at the frame design on this, really quite cool to see. It's got a, uh, it's a chrome molly frame, and as you can see, it's got no pivots as such, but you have got that big old sort of lump of elastomer rubber there in the place of what would be metal. So the frame can actually flex a little bit just to give it a bit more comfort. That was something we saw experimented with loads in the 90s. And in fact, one frame manufacturer that really got that right was Moots that make titanium bikes like that. And I think Neil rode one in an Iceland video against Cy Richardson from GCN, actually. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the description underneath this. But there you go, look at the bike, look how pure that frame line looks. A traditional double diamond, um, double triangle, diamond style design there. Wicked looking bike. A few more shots there, some of the details, Sun Sax rear hub and it's got the uh, Avid Speed Dial 1.0 brake levers as well. Yeah, really cool to see. Oh, I love all this old stuff. Uh, Richie Zadmax tires on there, uh, Shimano Livio, a bit of a concoction of stuff on there, granted, but um, 12 kilos in weight. Wicked, thank you Sabine for sending that in, really cool to see. Uh, if anyone's got anything old or you wanna know about anything old retro stuff, let us know in those comments. <laughs> So now it is time for the quiz answers. So the first question regarding Hope Team Green and where that came from. So when you are anodizing different colors, some colors are kind of more stable. It's easier to achieve consistency with you know, some colors more than others. Now green is a color that is quite hard to achieve consistency. You know, you've heard, I'm sure various stories, I know I have, of, you know, 
having to match up different sides of calipers from brake companies or even fork legs from certain uh, fork manufacturers to get the same look because obviously if you have half a caliper that's one color and half the other it doesn't look very good i know trick stuff one of the things they do is they you know have to match a batch up all very carefully and this is something that hope do as well so they want to carry on doing their green but they thought they would enjoy the exclusivity of how hard it is to consistently anodize colors in that green and well they do it just as team issue for their pro riders only and i think it's great it means when you see, see some hope team green you know they're the real deal and i like that so the next question cane creek where did it all come from where did it begin well it was dire comp so for those of you that don't know there used to be a thing called a threadless headset i'm sure you're all very familiar but dire comp with their a headset kind of brought this new standard and this new way of mounting our forks so we've got a lot to be thankful for and it started off as dire comp and they eventually became cane creek so a bit of a bit of retro knowledge for you there and the last question who developed the Asagai, so a really famous pro rider, sometimes called the Ass Guy, which I'm not going to get into, but it is, of course, Greg Minar. The word Asagai is basically a name for an iron tipped Zulu spear, I believe. So, certainly cool, nice bit of heritage. Now, guys, that is it for another weekly GMBN tech show. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and get in the comments. I want to know if you agree with me about the white ties. I know other people like them, that you get the mint green Michelin ones and all sorts. Personally, I, I'm not so sure. I like the gum walls and then that's it. So get in the comments. Do you agree with me or am I just absolutely crackers? Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.